Welcome to the introduction to blockchain technology and distributed ledgers. My name is Gilbert Fritgen and I am Professor in PayPal FNR Pearl Chair in Digital Financial Services at the SNT, the Interdisciplinary Center for Security, Reliability and Trust at the University of Luxembourg. So, what is blockchain technology? Imagine that each and every one of us had a good old-fashioned traditional notebook in their pockets. But our notebook is not a usual notebook, it's more like a magic notebook, like from a Harry Potter book. If one of us writes something into this notebook, it automatically appears in everyone else's notebook. Furthermore, our notebook is immutable. That means if I write something into the notebook, there is no way of removing it or altering it, neither for me nor for everyone else. A blockchain is nothing else than a set of these notebooks. If something is added to a blockchain, it automatically appears for everyone else participating and no one is able to change it later on. So, how does it work? And what does it mean for our society and economy? I guess you know Encyclopedia Britannica. You may even have it somewhere in your apartment. But when was the last time you looked into it? Probably today you would rather look up Encyclopedia Britannica on Wikipedia. So obviously in the past decades the Internet has changed how we consume media. In the past decades we have seen a move from centralized content to decentralized content. Centralized content means that when you take for example Encyclopedia Britannica there was one publisher collecting the information to be included in the next edition. This publisher might even have contacted me and asked me to write a couple of sentences on the topic of blockchain technology and distributed ledgers, including only my single perspective. With Wikipedia, we have decentralized content creation. Everyone can contribute. Wikipedia brings together a group of contributors and features mechanisms to choose which articles to publish and which change proposals to apply. This is what the so-called Internet of Information enabled us to do. So what does blockchain change about that? Blockchain is expected to enable the Internet of Trust. But what does that mean? Remember our magic notebook? Whenever I write something in my book, it appears in everyone else's notebook and it's immutable. I cannot change it, I cannot forge it. All our notebooks have the same content. These magic notebooks are a decentralized replacement for the centralized registries of today. Without magic notebooks, you need to have some trusted central entity that manages only one single central book, one single point of truth. A centralized bookkeeping infrastructure that is basically how today's banking system works. Your bank holds a central book, including your and other customers' accounts. Money transfers are recorded in the bank's book. Multiple banks might have multiple books, but they are not magic. They are again connected through a trusted third party, the central bank. Cryptocurrencies aim to be an alternative to the banking system and central banks in terms of payments. However, as we will see later, Blockchain can enable many use cases in addition to cryptocurrencies. The only prerequisite is that a use case requires some level of trust that can be fulfilled by our magic notebooks. And this is why many people believe that blockchain will imply a paradigm change. From the Internet of Information to the Internet of Trust. When you look at the history of the Internet, you will see that in its early stages we basically just moved bits and bytes. The World Wide Web, as you know it, composed of websites connected by hyperlinks, is just a protocol invented by Tim Berners-Lee. Soon after the World Wide Web was there, people started doing e-commerce, buying and selling over the Internet. What you know today as social networks started as Web 2.0. The idea was that everyone can contribute, everyone can make changes on websites like, for example, Wikipedia. 
Now we have the mobile internet, so we carry our smartphones. We have the Internet of Things. An increasing number of machines are connected to the internet. But still, we are only moving information from A to B. We are still on the Internet of Information. To make a monetary transaction on the internet, you need to go through a trusted third party. You need to go to a bank and give them the information, please transfer money from A to B. The blockchain now creates another layer on the internet, a layer of trust. The internet of trust is then called Web3. But how does it work? To explain, I will use the easiest example, cryptocurrencies. The term blockchain consists of two parts. One is block and the other one is chain. A block is basically a page in our notebook. A block contains a list of transactions, like the one in this example, Alice to Bob 9, Alice to Carol 5, something like that. It is just a page in our book where people can add the transactions they want to do. Now, how can we make sure that the information is immutable, that no one can change it? And how is the information distributed to all the other magic notebooks? Here comes the second part of blockchain, the chain. You can imagine the chain basically as the binding of the book. It holds together the individual pages so that the pages cannot be exchanged or altered. So the binding of the book, the changing of the block, is based on a mathematical function called hash function. A hash function is a mathematical function with a few special properties. One of these properties is that it is unidirectional. That means that you cannot calculate the function's input from its output. It's also compressing. You can basically feed it data of arbitrary size. However, you will always get a hash value of the same size as the output. With the help of a hash function, we can now connect our blocks, the pages of our book. How do we do that? On each page of our book, in each block, we have our transactions. At the end of each page, we calculate the hash value for this page for all the content and all transactions that are listed. And we take this hash value and copy it to the top of the next page. Thus, the hash value of the last page becomes an input for the hash value of the next page. Again, we list our transactions, calculate the overall hash value, and copy this again to the next page. This creates the binding of our magic notebook. And this is the chain in blockchain. Now, how does this binding, this chaining of the blocks help? Let's say that Alice likes to alter some of her previous transactions. She likes to change the nine she transferred to Bob to a three. Obviously, after this manipulation, the hash value at the bottom of the page will not match and the block would be invalid. Now let's say that Alice can recalculate the manipulated block's new hash value. Still, this does not help her, as we have connected the blocks by copying the hash values to the respective next block, she would need to recalculate the hash values of all following blocks. This makes it quite hard for Alice to try to forge some of her previous transactions. If you are careful, you might however have noticed a property of our hash function that might still be a problem. A hash function is performant. On the one hand, this helps, as everyone can quickly check if a hash value still matches the input, the block's content. However, what stops Alice from just quickly recalculating and forging all the hash values of all following blocks? We somehow have to make it hard for Alice to do that. You might have noticed another thing that is special about our blockchain. All the hash values here start with four zeros. And this is not a coincidence. Let's say that when we distributed our magic notebooks among everyone, 
we agreed that valid hash values need to start with a certain number of zeros, in our example here 4. This means that a block is only a valid block if its hash value starts with four zeros. But a hash value is created from the input through the hash function. How do we get a hash value that starts with four zeros? The only way to do this is to have the best of luck. There is some text just below the transactions and still above the hash value. This text is called NOS, short for number used once. The NOS is picked randomly over and over again until you find a NOS that when added to the block yields us a hash value that fulfills our criterion to start with four zeros. You have the given content of the block and you try out NOSes until you find one that gives you four zeros in the hash value. But it is not only one of us trying this. Every one of us who has one of these notebooks will try to find the correct NOS to validate the next block, the next page in our book. Each of us tries out random values over and over again. And if one of us finds the NOS to validate the next block, they basically raise their hand, I've got it, and share the new block the new page in our book to all other participants using the good old peer-to-peer -peer algorithms that we used to use for file sharing. And this makes it hard for Alice to change her previous transactions. So why does it make it so hard? Alice would need to be very, very quick. Finding the correct NOS for one manipulated block is one thing. However, at the same time as Alice tries to do her manipulation, all others continue to validate block after block, building on the original unaltered block. Therefore, when Alice tries to distribute her old manipulated block to the others, they will just say, well, but we are five blocks further, perfectly validated. We do not believe this one. This way we can ensure that Alice would really have a hard time making this attack. The only way that Alice would be able to forge something would be if she would have more computing power than all of us combined, more means to try different random variables, and this is today very, very unrealistic. Now, with all these calculations, our magic notebooks start to warm up a little bit. And heat, we all know, needs energy. And energy needs to be paid for. So why should anyone participate in validating the blocks bearing these costs? This brings us to the topic of mining. You've probably heard of mining as the way to create bitcoins. However, mining is not about looking for bitcoins. It is about validating blocks. The trick is that we agree in advance that whoever finds the NOS, whoever is able to validate the block, may add one transaction out of nowhere to myself, a predefined number of bitcoins. This way we ensure that our books stay immutable, stay safe, and that we all have the same content in our books. Obviously, mining requires a substantial amount of energy for otherwise useless trial and error calculations. There is much to criticize about Bitcoin, but this is how it works. However, there are other mechanisms to achieve the same or at least a similar goal. These mechanisms are called consensus mechanisms. They are built to ensure a consensus about the content of our books and to ensure that all books include the same transactions. Consensus mechanisms generally build on scarce resources to decide who validates the next block. The mechanism that I just described is called proof of work. The scarce resource is energy transformed into computing power. 
Bitcoin is the only major blockchain that still uses the proof of work consensus mechanism. The most prominent blockchain using the proof of stake mechanism is Ethereum. Ethereum used to use proof of work, but switched to proof of stake in September 2022, mainly because proof of work's energy consumption. In proof of stake, cryptocurrencies, or more generally tokens, are used as scarce resource. Participants can stake their cryptocurrencies. Depending on the amount they stake, participants may be selected to validate the next block. If they correctly validate, they will earn a reward. If they try to betray, their staked cryptocurrencies will be frozen. Proof of stake needs much less energy than proof of work. It is already closer to the level of enterprise IT systems. However, some criticize that proof of stake will make the rich richer as they have higher chances of getting selected as validators and earning rewards. Proof of authority is used for private blockchains. Bitcoin, for example, runs on a public blockchain. Everyone can download a client and participate anonymously, even do mining. Private blockchains are used in more business-like contexts, where all participants are previously known. The scarce resource is then the participant's identity. Let's say, for example, that five companies share one of our notebooks to coordinate some business process. The companies can just agree to digitally sign the pages and turns. Again, it would be hard for one company to forge a page sometime in the past. They would need to have access to the signatures of all other companies. Furthermore, if one company tries to betray, the others can just decide to exclude it from the system. We've now seen public blockchain networks like Bitcoin or Ethereum that are permissionless. That means that everyone can use them without registering. We've also seen private permission blockchain networks that built upon proof of authority with pre-registered participants. It should not remain unmentioned that there are also some public permission blockchain networks that are in principle open to everyone, but that require some kind of registration. In general, the more private and more permissioned a blockchain network is, the more it is considered centralized. The more public and the more permissionless a blockchain network, the more it is considered decentralized. There is one topic left that we have not addressed and that is relevant for public and private blockchains. Smart contracts are not contracts in the legal sense, but rather programming logic on the blockchain. Coming back to our magic notebook, why should you only use it for stupid transactions like Alice to Bob? A smart contract implements logic. Let's say Alice transfers 100 units of some cryptocurrency to Bob as a loan using a smart contract. As we have our magic notebook, everyone knows that Alice has 100 less and Bob has 100 more. They further agree that whenever Bob receives funds in the future, 10% will automatically go to Alice until the debt is paid, including interest and compound interest. So when Bob receives 50, five will automatically go to Alice. After each transaction, after each block, everyone using our magic notebook can assess if someone else has enough funds to do a payment or not. This obviously also brings about some privacy issues with or without smart contracts. And there are also solutions to that, but those we will not cover today. Legally, what is written in the book is not really a contract, but we call it as is because it very well describes what is happening. Others may also call it chain code. What is interesting now about these smart contracts, this chain code, is that there is some computing capacity available that does not depend on running some central server or similar. The code will be executed whenever something relevant happens in our book. 
And this logic will continue as long as people somewhere in the world continue adding pages to the book. And I can define, everyone can define, what logic they want to write into this book. This is also why the Ethereum Foundation calls its solution a world computer. While Bitcoin wants to build a world currency, Ethereum wants to build a world computer. Now, obviously, this world computer needs to be operated in some way. And I cannot just do this for free. Otherwise, some people might have funny ideas of what to do with a world computer. Thus, all of these smart contracts will also require a small fee. For Ethereum, this fee is paid in Ether, Ethereum's cryptocurrency. However, since Ethereum does not want to build a world currency, you can consider Ether rather to be something like an operating resource. It's more like a barrel of oil in the real world. Both are traded on liquid markets. You can buy and sell them very easily. Using smart contracts now offers to implement real business logic on the blockchain. This starts with simple digital assets that can be owned and transferred like cryptocurrencies. You might have heard of NFTs, non-fungible tokens, but it goes as far as implementing the logic of whole virtual organizations. In recent years, my team and I have talked to various organizations and also participated in joint projects. Our objective was to assess the actual utility of blockchain technology in different industries, be it private or public blockchains. We did not want to advocate for technology, but we wanted to find out if and where it brings some advantages. Over time, we identified several patterns, several use cases that might fit the technology well. Many businesses are looking at these today. However, this is subject to one of our other videos. So, thank you for watching and stay tuned.